Welcome to The Catholic Perspective, a podcast brought to you by rcspirituality.org. Enjoy the episode. Hi, Father Brandenburg. Jeff, great to be with you here. Great to have you on the podcast. Hey, it's great to be back. It's been a couple of years, I think, since we last since recorded we a session together. Yep. Today, we're going to be talking about your most recent book, Lessons from the Workshop of St. Joseph. Yes. What inspired you to write this book? That's a great question. You know, I never really had thought about ever writing a book on St. Joseph. Um, it actually came about because of cancer. So about four and a half years ago, I was diagnosed with multiple myeloma cancer and uh, it was going through chemo and all of the treatments for that, recovering from it. And I couldn't do my normal annual spiritual exercises. So in lieu of that, I asked my superior if I could do the 19th annotation, <laughs> which is a form of the spiritual exercises, but in your daily life. So you have a person who directs you, you meet with them on a weekly basis, and they kind of give you some tips and insights and direction to go in prayer. And you're praying about the normal themes that are in the uh, spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius. And so I had uh, Janet Lees, uh, who was directing me in that. Uh, she's from Cincinnati, and I live in Atlanta, Georgia now. And uh, so I was meeting with her every week. And as I went through the themes of the spiritual exercises, particularly on the life of Christ, all these insights started popping up about St. Joseph. <laughs> and obviously the spiritual exercise is all about, you know, praying through scripture and you're praying uh, to know Christ more deeply. And yet for some mysterious reason, Jesus was showing me his foster father and insights about him and what was going through his mind and what he experienced. And I, I didn't, you know, I didn't think too much of it. I jotted it down in my journal and uh, until one day I just, they kept coming and I, I mentioned to Janet, I said, you know, I'm getting all these insights, really cool insights on St. Joseph. You know, maybe God wants me to write a book on St. Joseph. And then I forgot about it. <laughs> uh, until a few months later, December 8th of 2020. That's a feast day. That's a feast day. Exactly. It was also the day that Pope Francis announced the year of St. Joseph. And so I took that as a pretty clear sign. <laughs> like it was like a, a kick in the backside, like, all right get going on this. Uh, you know, I gave you enough inspirations. Now get, get the work going. Um, so at that point I decided to preach a retreat on, uh, St. Joseph as a, as a way to get things going. So I do what I always do when I have a writing project in store. I, I start praying about it. I really taking it to my meditation, entering into scripture and asking the Lord what he wants me to say, what, what he wants me to share with the people that I'm going to preach the retreat to. Uh, so I did that for several months and preached the retreat for the first time in January of 2021. So a couple, like a month and a half after the launch of the year of St. Joseph. And uh, I also, I took the approach that I did in my prior book, um, most recent book before this one was on um, journey to joy, reflections on the seven sorrows of the blessed Virgin Mary. So in that book, I had used a lot of Christian artwork, music to bring out the sorrows of the blessed Virgin Mary. So in a similar way, uh, in the retreat that I preached, I, I went and looked for beautiful Christian artwork on St. Joseph, looked for uh, music, and the music selection was a lot less, but there was also, there was a lot of, of beautiful artwork. And just going through, you know, mosaics, paintings, tapestries, I mean, every art form that you can imagine, churches, architecture. So it was really beautiful to, to go through all of that. But the most profound part was entering more deeply into scripture. And my first reaction was like, okay, yeah, God's given me some insights about St. Joseph and in, in my retreat, but Joseph doesn't say a single word in scripture. So what am I going to write about? <laughs> he's pretty quiet. He's, he's not only quiet, he's silent. <laughs> not a single word, not even a no, not even a yes, honey. <laughs> but we do know he is a just man. That's for sure. Yes. And that was the first thing that comes up in scripture. You know, when St. Joseph is introduced in Matthew 119, as the Matthew writes, he was a just man. Uh, and the word for that in Greek is dikaios, uh, a word which is very rich in connotation. We kind of gloss over that when we read it in English. Oh, he's a just man. Yeah, he's a good guy. Nice guy. Regular Joe, regular Catholic guy. No, that's not what it means when you read the Greek word. The Greek word dikaios is evoking a whole tradition among the Jewish people of the upright man. The dikaios is the, the man who lives according to scripture, 
who takes care of the, the widow and the orphan, who fulfills all the precepts of the law, who loves God, who prays the, the Psalms. This is the connotation. This is like, this is the, the best guy out there. He's the dikaios, the, the just man. And that's how scripture presents him to begin with. Uh, and, and so as I was going through scripture and looking, okay, what, what I'm going to find about St. Joseph, I figured, well, maybe, maybe I can come up with five or six chapters. And then I started looking and it's like, okay, here's another episode. Oh, here he is again. Oh, here's an implication of what he did. And as I put all those pieces together, it was like, oh, wait, there's 14 different episodes here. And then I made the connection, okay, like there's 14 stations of the cross. There's 14 episodes in the life of St. Joseph. It's kind of like a, a, a way of St. Joseph. And so as part of that first retreat, I had a, a moment of inspiration. And in, in a sh- like an hour and a half, I wrote out a series of prayer reflections on each of those 14 episodes in the life of St. Joseph, which constituted a way of St. Joseph, which we actually prayed with the men that were on that retreat. And it's included in the book. Well, I, I mentioned the, 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 the 14 episodes in the book. They form the, the structure of the book. But I also have a separate uh, Way of St. Joseph, which is a, a, a book of reflections it's called The Way of St. Joseph. It's available on Amazon.com as a separate publication from this. And it's available in an, a bilingual edition, Spanish and English. Um, funny thing that happened, that, uh, the, a week after I preached that first retreat, I, uh, I was asked to preach it again to another group of men. And two gentlemen from Mexico heard about the retreat and flew in uh, to, to participate in the retreat. And they were listening to the whole, all the reflections, the 14 different stations of the life of St. Joseph. And, uh, you know, uh, and in each one of the stations, the key question I asked myself is, what was the fear that Joseph made of, might have faced in this, in this particular station? And then no, don't stay in the fear, but how did he overcome it? Because in overcoming it, he shows us how to overcome fear in our own lives. Let's face it, Jeff. I mean, you're a tough dude. Uh, I'm a little, maybe a little less t- tough, but we all face fears. And I think that's an important re- reality to, to take into consideration in our Christian lives. You use one of my favorite words on how he overcame his fear. What's that? Audacity. Oh, I love that word. Audacity is a great word. Um, and, and actually, it is the word that St. Thomas Aquinas uses when he talks about the passions. Uh, in the f- introduction in the first chapter of the book, I really go into St. Thomas Aquinas' description of the passions, because the passions are not what we usually think of. You know, and usually today when we hear the word passion, we think of, oh, he was angry, or, he, you know, he was full of lust, you know, looking at, at that woman. Well, that's not what St. Thomas Aquinas means. That's not what the tradition of the church means, or Aristotle for that matter. When they talk about passions, they're talking about the, these spontaneous reactions that we have to a provocation, to a stimulus. It'd be comparable to like modern psychology, what we would call emotions or feelings. So the passions are these spontaneous reactions that come up. And according to St. Thomas Aquinas, he has a whole treatise in the Summa uh, that talks about the passions. And he enumerates 11 passions and 10 of them are in pairs. So they're matched with each other. And then there's an 11th one, which is anger, which is all by itself. But when he talks about the passion of fear, he matches it with audacity. Oftentimes it's translated in modern translations with courage or fortitude or something. But the actual word in Latin is audacia, which is better translated as audacity. So fear is countered with audacity. Um, And and this is what St. Joseph is showing us. And and so in each one of these 14 stations, St. Joseph faces a fear overcomes it with audacity. And he shows us as Christian men how to have audacity in our own lives. What happened with the two men that came to the retreat from oh, Mexico? Yeah, go back to the story. So these two guys who came on the retreat, they, they were listening to the whole retreat, you know, and enjoying it. And they came up to me at the end and said, Father, did you know that in Mexico, we actually have started building a pilgrimage site called the Way of St. Joseph? And it's, it's meant to do exactly what you're doing with your retreat. And, and can we take your 14 stations and make that part of our pilgrimage site down in Mexico? I said, sure, of course. So now there's this beautifully developed place. It's in a little town called Cuatro Cienegas in Mexico, in the northern part of Mexico, in the desert. 
And it recreates those 14 stations in the life of the Holy Family and of St. Joseph. And you can walk through the desert. And, and it's, you know, oftentimes people hear desert, Jeff, and they think, oh, dry, nothing there, miserable. It's actually one of the most beautiful places I've been on this planet. It is extraordinarily beautiful. Uh, there's, when you look out at the desert, all you see is brown. But when you get into the desert, it's a totally different story. You start to notice all the wildlife that there is, the insects, the, the different types of worms and snakes. I even came across a rattlesnake on one of my pilgrimages there. Uh, we saw wild horses. And in this particular area of the desert, it's really beautiful. Um, NASA was looking for the place on Earth that was most like Mars for the formation of life on planet Earth. And they chose this little town out of all the places on the planet because there's a certain bacteria which goes there and astromalatites uh, that are very close to the very first forms of life on Earth. Um, and it's in an ancient seabed. So they're in that valley, surrounded by beautiful mountains all around. On this desert floor, there are what they call posas in the, in the local vernacular. They're little ponds, but it's not rainwater or runoff, or runoff water. It's actually uh, leftover water from ancient seas. And so the, the mineral content in the water is high in magnesium and, and other heavy mineral, minerals. So it, it, we, I actually went swimming in a couple of these little ponds. And it, it, it's really unique kind of experience because it's not like normal fresh water. So kind of like a snow tag, it leaves kind of that greasy feeling on your skin? Um, no, it's not greasy. And it's not like salt water either. Um, it's, a, it's a heavier type of water. So it's harder to swim. You have to work a little harder to, to stay above the surface. Um, and it, it's just, it's hard to describe, but it's, it's a unique experience. Uh, and they have in that little Valley, they have more native species like that, uh, that are, uh, there's a special word for it in, uh, in, in the, the, the scientific, uh, jargon, which I forget right now, but the most, uh, species that are only found in that place, uh, on the planet of plants and animals and, um, uh, dragonflies, uh, turtles. So even from a flora and fauna perspective, it's a fascinating place to visit. And, and, and in that location, they've built this way of St. Joseph that goes through the desert, which creates a really unique uh, pilgrimage experience. So as you wrote the book, you reflect back a lot on your childhood. Yes, yes. Well, I, you know, I, I learned a lot from my dad growing up. You know, I grew up in rural Iowa. Uh, my dad is a welder. He had his own welding uh, and fabrication shop that uh, from the time I was really little, I started helping out my dad's shop. You know, when I was really little, the only thing I could do is maybe pick up the tools and learn the names of the tools, sweep the floor a little bit. But as I got older, my dad would entrust me with more jobs. And I learned, I think as most men do, they learn a lot of lessons for good and for bad from their dads growing up. And I, I figured if we want to learn from St. Joseph well, I, I tie, would, wanted to tie it back to how did I learn lessons from my dad? So in each one of the chapters, I start off with an autobiographical note of some lesson that I learned from my dad, either in his shop or from just life lessons, and then compare that to how that connects to the particular episode of the life of St. Joseph. So it creates some really interesting uh, connections. Some of them are a little, a little more of a stretch, but for the most part, they were you know, really tying into uh, a deep reminiscence for myself. And you know, last week, Jeff, I was uh, visiting my parents and my dad was recently in a bad car accident. So he was, you know, in recovery from that. And I was recording the book, uh, recording an audio version of the book. And um, my dad was sitting there in his, his chair in his back brace and I was reading the book to him. So that was kind of a, a, a neat way to to see his reactions as I was reading the book. And he was, he'd already read the book, of course, but just watching his reactions, he heard me tell the stories from my perspective of what I learned in my dad's own shop growing up. And, and what I've also learned from the workshop of St. Joseph. There's a chapter in here. It's chapter 11 and it's titled returning failure, mm -hmm. but it's also the shame of shabbiness. Mm. And, Living through the last 20 years or so, going into 2008, 2009, I saw a lot of people that were extremely wealthy that lost all their wealth. In COVID, many business owners that I know, they lost their businesses yes. or 
lost their work and were extremely successful and then had to return from failure. Yes. And in some cases, they had to go to the shame of shabbiness. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about the shame of shabbiness. Uh, well, this this corresponds to that chapter in uh, the Holy Family's life when they were returning from exile in Egypt, essentially, coming back to a home which was cert- most certainly in disarray. And, you know, all the townspeople thinking, oh, here comes Joseph and Mary, you know, and all the stories would start off like, oh, didn't we, didn't something happen before they left town? And, and all the stories circulating, the rumors, the gossip mill, and having to start over, starting afresh, with, you know, rebuilding his business or trying to find work. We don't know exactly if he was a business owner or if he was working for others. But the fact is, I mean, he would have had to start everything from scratch after being away for a couple of years. Um, and, and in those circumstances, I think we can all relate to that because there's a fear in every person that I know of failure. Uh, and one of the hardest things for a man, for example, is to lose his job or to declare bankruptcy, you know, to face the chagrin of what are your neighbors going to think? What are your parents going to think? I, I remember in this particular chapter with my, uh, my own dad, it was, a. Uh, my dad, you know, he owned his, his welding business and he had uh, designed a new fertilizer applicator machine that, with a friend of his and we moved to a different town because he thought, oh yeah, this is really going to take off, and, you know, a new business. And, and so we moved 40 minutes away from Bancroft, Iowa to Rodman, Iowa, and it, the business venture didn't take off, not until many years later. But in the meantime, uh, my family was on food stamps. And I remember hearing a comment from my grandpa to my parents. I don't think he knew that I was hearing him. He said, you're moving back. You're moving there. Oh, no. You know, just like the disappointment in my grandpa's voice um, talking to my parents. And, and then, you know, my dad failing in the business. And we were on food stamps and couldn't properly heat our home in the middle of the winter. I mean, it, we went through some pretty, uh, you know, some pretty stark times there. Um, but in, in the dark moments, Jeff, I think it gives us the opportunity to appreciate the beautiful moments and the most difficult moments of life are what shape us and make us who we are. I came across in my, uh, studies for my doctorate in, in, uh, and leadership through Creighton university. One of the things that jumped out at me was the studies on grit. You know, the great leaders, it's not that they didn't face adversity in their lives. In fact, every great leader faced significant adversity in their lives. And what distinguishes the great leaders from those who are mediocre or who never really broke out is how they recovered, how they reacted and how they recovered from adversity. Those who are able to face the adversity, overcome it, triumph over it, and I'm not saying that simply on a human level. There's also a dimension of overcoming of adversity, which is humility. I was uh, on the flight here today. I was sitting next to a guy who, <laughs> funny, funny little story. It's, this is modern communication. So I was sitting in the flight and he hadn't talked to me for, you know, for almost an hour and a half. And uh, three quarters of the way into the flight, he turns his phone screen towards me. And points to his screen like, hey, you know, read this. Didn't say anything to me. He says, you know, and his phone screen said, hey, um, you know, I'm going through a difficult moment. Please pray for me. Uh, my name is such and such. And, uh, you know, please pray for my son too. <laughs> I looked at him kind of like, okay. Um, and then, I, and then I, I spoke to him. I, I don't know if you're supposed to do that on planes anymore, but I actually spoke to him. Uh, and I said, hey, you know, I'll pray for you. Happy to pray for you. And I'll pray for your son too. And, uh, and then we were talking about it and, and, and uh, at the end of the flight, after we'd actually had a conversation, he shared with me, you know, he was going through health difficulties. He said, you know what? I, before I thought I had it all together, I was, I was flying high. I, was, I didn't need God. I was, but this difficulty, I, I feel humbled and I feel like I'm ready to learn. And there's something really profound in that. Oftentimes we talk about best practices, you know, let's learn from the best practices. But the reality is, and the scientific studies have shown this in a very interesting way, we don't learn very much from success. We learn from our failures. We learn from failure. 
failure is the greatest, uh, it's the greatest teacher. Because when you go, when you fail at something, your brain goes into overdrive trying to figure out how to not experience that negativity again. And so you go into learning mode. And, and God is the perfect pedagogue. He, he knows how to teach us. And so he allows failure in our lives, not to hurt us, but because he loves us. And I think every good parent knows that as well. Sometimes you have to let your children fall instead of trying to protect them from every failure in their lives, let them fall so that they can learn, you know, fall in a protected environment. And God allows us to fall as well. Uh, so failure should not be see seen as the end of the road or there's no hope. Where Christ is present, there's always hope. He is the source of hope. And a lot of times he works through the failures to bring us to greater glory and greater goodness in the future. Tell us how St. Joseph can help us be a better listener to God's voice. <laughs> well, I feel like I'm doing a lot of talking here, so I'm not doing much listening. But anyway, that's the nature of the podcast. <laughs> that's the job of the podcast host is to ask the questions. <laughs> right. Well, I think it's very simple. Look at the way that St. Joseph kept the proportions. What percentage did he give to speaking? According to scripture, zero. <laughs> it was all listening. Um, but I think that, you know, joking aside, I think the greatest insight here is to look at his attentiveness with dreams. And I mentioned this in one of the other chapters in the book. You know, Joseph has four recorded dreams in scripture where God speaks to him through an angel or directly in the, in the course of the dream, but all in the course of dreams. Now, I don't know about you, Jeff, but I have dreams all the time. I rarely remember them. And I can think of only maybe one or two occasions in my entire life where I have ever acted upon a dream. <laughs> okay. So for Joseph to have four dreams, where not only does he, he listen to God's voice, but he acts upon it immediately. There's no hesitation. That is an incredible lesson. Now, God has given us St. Joseph as our, our, our father in faith as well, and as a model for us of manhood and of how to listen. And I think buried within what we can see in scripture about his action uh, and how he attentively listens to God's voice, even in the course of dreams, that tells us a tremendous amount about listening. What are some of the biggest lessons that you learned, or what is the biggest lesson that you learned from writing this book? Hmm. That is a great question, Jeff, and not one that I have actually pondered at all. I think maybe one of the biggest lessons that I've learned is a hidden one that is not tied to any one of the particular chapters. And it's the fact that there is so much in Scripture that is latent. We can so easily gloss over Scripture. I was... Uh, just started, you know, uh, yesterday meditating on a, a commentary on the Gospel of John, uh, in which he, uh, the very beginning they quote one of the church fathers who says that the Gospel of John is so shallow that a, a lamb can can walk in its depths, and so deep that it, an elephant can swim. <laughs> and I I feel that that is perhaps the deepest reality we can see. I mean. We know that God's word is living and effective, sharper than any two-edged sword, as the letter of the Hebrews says. It indeed is. And the more that you take time to pray and enter into scripture, the more God speaks to that. I mean, I, in meditating on these 14 episodes, I never thought there would be even be 14 episodes, but meditating on each one and taking the time to go into scripture, there were just different things that started to emerge and come out. Uh, and I think that's where, you know, when St. Paul says in the New Testament, he says that, you know, a, a good steward is able to bring out of the storehouse things both new and old. And I think as Christians, it's important for us to meditate on Scripture. Not just read it, not just study it, but to meditate on it, um, to allow God to speak to us through it, um, to allow it to sink in. And that's where the practice of Lexio Divina and Christian meditation can be so fruitful in our lives, as, as you know from your own experience, Jeff. I'm sure many of our listeners do. Uh, and if anyone, anyone's looking for good resources on that, uh, Father John Bartunek's book, uh, The Better Part, is a phenomenal introduction 
on how to get started in, in Christian meditation and, and Lexio Divina. And there's many other excellent resources on that. Um, but as Christians, we need to pray. We need to let God's word uh, move us. In the book, you have reflection questions. What's the best way to use this book, Father? I think it's up to each person. Uh, I think some people will get a lot out of it just reading it. I think other people uh, would really love to do this in a small group. Uh, I think that's like a, a men's, oh, not necessarily a Bible study, because it's, it, 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 but it is taking a scripture passage in each uh, chapter. Not a Bible study per se, but more of a book study. Uh, could be a very, very fruitful way to do this. Uh, you could do it as a personal retreat. Um, there's many different ways you can take it. And I think it's kind of up to how each person uh, sees it in, in, their, uh, in, in their little world. Where can you get the book? You can get it primarily from two places. Uh, you can get it on Amazon.com, uh, the Lessons from the Workshop of St. Joseph, author Father Daniel Brandenburg. Uh, or you can get it from rcspirituality.org. And especially if you're going to order in bulk, you know, if you're gonna, let's say you're going to do it for a book study or something like that, I would recommend getting your books from RC Spirituality. You can get a volume discount, um, plus less of the proceeds go to, <laughs> to finance a Amazon. <laughs> Thank you, Father. God bless you, Jeff. God Great to be you. with you again. Thank you. You have been listening to The Catholic Perspective, a resource from rcspirituality.org. Please visit our website and check out more great resources to help you pray, learn, grow, and go. Please join our team of digital missionaries by subscribing at rcspirituality.org.